I'm Kelly Westmacott. I'm from the University of the West of England in Bristol. So I'm actually in the Centre for Research in Biosciences and I am currently in my final year of my PhD, so in chemistry. So our application of our technology is, is pigs. So that's how we've merged the pigs so with our chemistry technology. So the key points that we're going to cover is the novel technology and how now we're going to our prototype device and next week we'll be taking it out to abattoirs and seeing how we can detect bortane online. Our technology can also um, be simultaneous and, and just rapid, and that's what we need online for our detection systems. So I'm at the Centre for Research in Biosciences. Um, so we have some, um, some big groups at UE that are looking at biosensors. We do have two big departments, actually. We do have an institute for biosensing technology as well. Um, but I am actually based in CRIB. So my research team. So. I have three supervisors. I have um, a director of studies, which is Professor John Hart. You can see him in the middle there. Um, he has many expertise in electrochemical sensors, so that's the basis of our topic. So if you think about the glucose sensor um, that you use for diabetics, it's a very similar principle to that, or the pregnancy test even. So that's the basis of our work. So he's got many years of experience um, in this, and also biosensor fabrication, which is really important for how we make our sensors. So we've also got my other supervisor, Professor Lena Duran. Um, she has many years of experience um, in the pig um, sector, so looking at bore taint. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail about that in a minute, because that's quite important to how we've got to this stage where we are today. And we also have Dr Adrian Crew. Um, so he's more of an environmentalist, but he does have a sense of background. So, so we've got a really good team that have been helping me to get to where I am today, because I'm in my third year of my PhD. So going to finish uh, at the end of the year. So back to the expertise then of our, of our uh, team. So Lena published back 16 years ago, looking into the genetic role that's played with ball chain. So obviously this is, this is really important. This actually led to a patent. Um, so, sorry, this is not working. Mm -hmm. There we are. So her patent's been filed um, quite a number of years ago, and so obviously this is a long-term goal. So, I mean, Caroline was saying that genetics is a big, important factor for this, but we, we really have got a long, a long way still to go with this, and that is obviously a very complicated topic. But we definitely want to be able to assist this, so our novel technology will be able to help with these genetic trials. Um, so currently, other methods that are out there to analyse bortane are expensive, and they, they take a lot of lab, lab equipment, really. So our technology will be able to take it out onto onto an abattoir. So we'll be doing that next week, actually, so that's quite exciting. So many more things that Lena's been doing at UE um, and actually at Bristol University, where she was before. Um, so she's done, she's had quite a big team, research team, looking into other um, things that can be markers for bore taint. Um, and she's definitely looked more in the genetic side of it. So. In terms of bringing it together, we go back to my supervisor, um, director, um, director of studies, uh, Professor John Hart. So his expertise really began many years ago in chemistry. Um, so he was looking at vitamin K in blood. So this is a really complex matrix. I mean, obviously, to analyse blood, that takes a lot of work. And he actually developed a really interesting system. So I say this, obviously, bore taint, adipose tissue is quite different to blood. However, there's the complexity of it that's important here. So we can see then his electrochemical measurement systems. This is based on a much larger system. So it is in tandem with a system which could separate the compounds. So, but now we've taken it much further and we can see that from his other studies later on, um, he was looking at cholesterol and using screen printed sensors. So that's the basis of what we do. So they're printed sensors. So they're inexpensive and they can be used um, in disposable formats, so, which is great for us, for carcasses. We don't want any contamination between pigs, so we can just use it one use and throw it away. So then if we move on then to what we've been doing later, um, John was looking at glucose as well, which I said is important for how, our, how we can compare what we do to what's actually out there on the market, because although people have been doing biosensors for years, only obviously so many of them have made it to be really like, big in, in, in the industry. So later on, we've been looking at arrays. This is when Dr. Adrian Crew joined the team. Um, and, and this is really important because they're actually developing uh, sensors for organophosphate pesticides. So these, obviously, in the environment are, are really bad. And I'm sure people coming from agricultural background will understand the importance of this. But we can see from this that we can develop arrays of sensors. And these arrays are really important. Um, 
So we can basically take our technology, what we're doing with the adipose tissue, and we're aiming to be able to look at other uh, factors. So we could look, for instance, vitamins, we could look at fatty acids, and we could be able to give a, a whole score. So people have been saying in the other breakouts, in the other sessions, that we want to be able to say that the meat is healthy. Well, we could definitely do that if we could actually give a value for all of these compounds in the tissue. So we'd definitely be ahead of the game in terms of other countries about how we could say is definitely in our, in our meat. So more recently, we've actually done a review on these sensors um, and how they're being used um, all around the world. And the most recent reviews really just showing that the printed ability is, and the portability of these machines means that they are advantageous over other technologies. So we'll have to take it right back. Um, so I wasn't obviously with UE at 2006. I actually started my degree in 2009. I did my undergrad there, and then I moved on to work for another company, which I was doing um, testing of different um, pesticides as well. And then I've come back now. So 2014 is when I began. So. Taking it back to the idea, though, um, Lena Duran, obviously, being in the pig sector, she realised there was a massive problem and the portain issue wasn't being solved. So she spoke to my other supervisors and they decided that their technology could definitely be useful and we could look into making a biosensor that could detect these compounds. So after that, they then managed to acquire some funding and so they managed to get the trial going. And later on, then BPEX, obviously, was now HDB, pork. They supplied some funding and Adrian managed to carry on his work, um, bringing the sensor to a more characterised state. So then later on, the um, BBSRC, a big research council, have been funding us and Adrian. And at this point, really, it's important to say 2011 is when we started looking at market research because we realised, although we've got these technologies, we really need to be able to actually get them out into into the industry and it's all well and good having these things if, if they're not actually useful to to producers then then we need to look at other ways of making it successful so this actually coincides really well with some of the other really big programs that's going on in the center for research and biosciences so um presley duran my supervisor was actually head of crib for five years now she's actually head of our entire research our university so she's been really vital with these products projects um and i'll explain a little bit more about those later um, that's really bringing together the EU and really the global issue. So in 2014 is when I started my PhD and that coincided again with some more funding from the BBSRC. So it's been great that me and Adrian can work together in making this a reality because the other thing with the university is that we have so many other projects ongoing that obviously this is just part of what everybody does. So you can see the time timeline, there are many other things uh, ongoing. So. JSR Genetics at this point joined us and they've been supplying samples and helping us with, with uh, other training aspects. Um, and then so really this is all coming up to the EU ban. So just as I finish and Adrian's project wraps up, we're going to see this ban in the EU, which could lead to some interesting practices being taken out. I mean, it depends how people want to do it. People have told me different things. I mean, I don't know how it's going to work, but our technology could definitely help with this. So if we see some of these other big projects that are ongoing, so the Marie Curie actions, so this is a lot of staff exchange programs, so we understand what's going on in other people's universities or institutions. Um, so really, the basis is to improve the quality of pork um, and working with all these other institutions, we can get to that point. And then if we have a look at this one here, it's the Alcasta project. Um, this one's quite important because it wasn't only just looking at um, reducing uh, castration in pigs, we were also looking at um, the dehorning of cattle. So obviously there's with much broad, broader project really. Um, but again, it taught us really what other people are doing and how we could tackle the issue. And then moving on to looking at other qualities in fat, like I said, the uh, biosensor array would be the ideal opportunity. And we now have a PhD student starting in September to look at fatty acids in, in pork. So really, what is the problem with boar taint? So like I said, people have told me there's not an issue. Some people have. I've spoken to some people that now don't go out and buy pork again because they don't like the taste of it. And at the end of the day, if, and that can be women more than men. So I guess that's a problem in a household. If, if the lady's going and doing the shopping and buying all the food and then doesn't want to repeat buy, that's definitely going to have a big impact on the industry. So... Um, I've actually seen lots of different things on websites, over the internet. Um, so I think it's quite important for us to see 
you know, how this is portrayed online. Um, so obviously the fiscal castration is a massive aspect. Obviously we don't castrate, but other countries do. Um, and then also looking at, you know, animal welfare. But then there's other aspects to that, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so if we look at the bans coming up, and then we can see that, you know, there are alternatives, and actually Pfizer Animal Health, which is now Zoetis, obviously have Improvac. Um, but that, so it's shown to, they think, obviously can reduce aggression, and that's just, I guess, from some having um, essentially castrated males, but chemically castrated. So that's the fear, I guess, is that people don't want to hear that there's chemicals in their food. So I guess that's something that we're battling with in the UK. So obviously later on, BPEX have been looking and saying that we've got some more, more technology coming up in the future. And I guess that's where the project started um, rolling on into the PhD. So what I'll do is show you what my objectives were for my project and uh, where we are today. So we're looking to characterize the sensor system um, for abattoir use, and it would be rapid and be able to simultaneously determine the compounds. So that's really important. A lot of other technologies can't simultaneously detect these compounds. So the rapid results are needed to prevent the meat reaching the consumer. And simply we can then separate these, and like Caroline said, we can think about mixing things together and reducing the bortain in the reaching the consumer. So we can also aid other methods. So the genetic selection is important, vaccination, obviously that people are thinking about taking that on more and more, and dietary manipulation. And obviously other potential strategies, because we obviously slaughter at a lower weight here, so we really need to start looking into weight trials. And this would be a really easy way to say whether or not we are getting more tainted carcasses on the market, um, instead of waiting for long lab-based studies that cost a lot of money. So ultimately improve customer satisfaction. So I'll just show you some other methods that are out there. Obviously, Caroline touched on the human nose. It's actually used in some abattoirs abroad. And actually, if you've seen Channel 4's Food Unwrapped, it's definitely worth having a look at one of the episodes on there because they show over an Italian um, abattoir where the lady is sat there all day soldering her meat and smelling it. So, uh, But it's quite interesting to see that the, even the men there were trying to smell it and they, they couldn't. So I guess that shows the variation in, in what's going on, really, um, in, in the complexity of bortain. So there's the soldering, and then we can move on to other methods. So a lot of lab methods use big, bulky equipment. So spectrophotometry would be a good method. However, it is bulky and still requires a lot of sample prep. You can get it a lot smaller now. So the nano drop is a really good example of how, how, how much smaller this technology is getting. But you still require a lot of sample preparation, which really we don't have time for in an abattoir setting. So this is a gas chromatograph, and this is the sort of thing I'm using to validate my sensors. Um, so again, really bulky, takes a lot of expensive equipment and a lot of time to prepare your samples. But you can also use liquid chromatography, so these are all very well-known gold standard techniques, but not useful for an abattoir. And then mass spectrometry, so this is something new that's come out. Again, extremely expensive, um, although it's quite easy on the sample prep, you only just have to heat your sample. It's quite good that you can, um, you can obviously use this in the lab and it is quite quick. So immunology, however, though, immu immu words out. immunology is not so useful though, because you could only detect one compound. So again, this is where our technology comes together. We can detect both compounds simultaneously. So, and the other thing is cross-reactivity. So we've had to do a lot of studies over these years to make sure that we're not going to get cross-reactivity because obviously that is a problem with sensors. So here's a little skin -off schematic of what we actually have um, to take on the farm. So our prototype is ready and we will be going next week. Um, so we can see then, so the speed of analysis is definitely an, an, an advantage. We can go under one minute. I'm pretty sure we can get lower than that. So it's just gonna take a bit more, a bit more time for more studies to, to prove that. Um, there's no preparation involved. It's simply inserting the sensors and then they also can be thrown away. So you won't get any contamination. So the instrumentation is portable and actually there's more scope to improve that. Um, with technology coming along, you can actually use sort of Wi-Fi, like you do with the glucose sensors. I don't know if you've seen people wearing them now. They can do real-time monitoring. And it sends data to their phone, to their doctor. You know, this is, I guess, the whole way we're going with technology and uh, monitoring. So this is an example of how we could just ping our data straight back and we could have a massive database of what's going on. You know, I guess if you've got uh, tags on, on carcasses, you'll know which and which one isn't, and then you could separate them off and make sure that you're not getting tainted meat in your prime products. So the simplicity as well, so we want to be able to 
work on a red light, green light system. And again, this is complicated by the fact that other people detect it differently, different countries, different processing types. And so obviously that would have to be set by the company that's using the technology. They'd have to set those thresholds. And obviously it's a platform, platform technology, so we can add more targets and look at other interesting compounds. So my data, I'm gonna show you this now. So this is my two, the two compounds, and the basis of this is that we've taken a, a sample of adipose tissue. We've analyzed it by the sensor, which you can see on the x-axis, and then on the y, we've got the chromatography, which we've compared it to. Now, that's a destructive method, so we've had to take the sensor um, piece of tissue and actually do a lot of processing to get it to the point where we can anal analyze it by gas chromatography. So we can highlight the thresholds here, and as uh, Caroline explained, these are the sort of generally used thresholds, but they, they could definitely be changed depending on where you were using the sensors. So we can see that our preliminary data shows that we do have good correlation, um, but I do have a lot more data in the pipeline that I'm still processing. So, And next week we'll get a lot more when we go out um, to the abattoir. So really, we've got to think about the future. So more samples. Um, and we'll also be looking at you know, a wider range of pig breeds because that's important for us to understand what's going on. I mean, there's breeds in different different breeds everywhere, so we need to be able to assess the, the difference of this. And then also looking at taking the, the sensors over to manufacturers, so really importantly, I mean, obviously being chemists, we, we aren't manufacturers of sensors, they need to be ready for the environment they're going into, and it obviously needs to be really robust to deal with that environment. Thank you.